Hey there, it's Dave Keller with Market Misbehavior. Today we're going to talk about the difference between leading indicators and lagging indicators in the Technical Analysis Toolkit. So I find when people are just getting started with technical analysis, they tend to think of the technical toolkit pretty simplistically, right? They seem sort of like a homogenous set of tools. They're all kind of similar, different ways of analyzing price. And then you've got lines, you've got indicators below the chart, and they're all kind of telling you similar things, right? Not really. And the more you learn about technical analysis, you'll find it's actually quite a diverse set of tools. And I find bucketing them into two major categories is pretty helpful at the beginning, leading indicators versus lagging indicators. Now, to be honest with you, the essence of technical analysis, there are some similarities with those different indicators. At the end of the day, you're analyzing price and volume data, and based on the patterns that you're seeing, you're anticipating what might come next. Now, before you think that's just a technical analysis thing, I would argue most financial analysis, if not all of it, is based on a similar premise. Fundamental analysis, if you're looking at a company fundamentally, what you're doing is you're looking at their financial statements, you're looking at their income statements and balance sheets and cash flow statements. You are uh, analyzing what the company has done. You're using earnings calls and company management, uh, you know, press conferences and other things to sort of figure out what the company is anticipating is coming next. At the end of the day, you determine whether you wanna buy or sell the stock today based on those projections of future earnings growth or future profitability. So in technical analysis, we're doing kind of the same thing. We're just using different data sets, right? We're using price and volume, analyzing what the markets are telling us about supply and demand and fear and greed, analyzing what we've experienced so far, looking back at what's happened, and then based on our knowledge of market history and market dynamics, and we can anticipate what might be coming next. Now, I talked about the differences between leading indicators and lagging indicators. And the way that I would think about it is leading indicators are basically designed to tell you something might be happening very soon. Lagging indicators are designed to tell you, yep, something important just happened. Now, those are very different because it's based on, you know, waiting for a signal to actually occur or getting a signal that a signal, you're getting an indication that a key signal might be coming very, very soon. And that's how I would think of those different mindsets of, uh, of technical analysis. And you'll find probably as an investor, you naturally gravitate to one or the other, right? If you're more of a contrarian, those leading indicators might be more attractive because you want to anticipate a turn before it happens. If you're more of a trend follower, which is how I would describe myself, I tend to favor more lagging indicators because I'm okay with missing the beginning of a move. I just want to play into the bulk of that trend as it starts to play out. Now we're going to look at a chart of Apple. We're going to talk about different indicators that are more leading and lagging, what they can tell us about the same chart at the same time. Before we get there, one more thing I want to tell you about. Today's video is brought to you by Seeking Alpha. I'm a big fan of places that allow you to better understand the market environment. I think SeekingAlpha.com is certainly one of those. When you go to the website, I would check out the stock screener, particularly because it allows you to use Seeking Alpha's proprietary quant model. In my experience working with institutional investors, we always had what's called an alpha model or a quantitative model, which really modeled the characteristics of strong companies, demonstrating strong growth prospects and strong price momentum. Seeking Alpha does a really good job of taking that institutional level quantitative capability and putting it in the hands of individual investors. If you go to marketmisbehavior.com slash seeking alpha or just click on the link in the description below, you can go right to a special offer. If you use the link, you get $50 off your first year and also get a seven day free trial to check everything out. So go to marketmisbehavior.com slash seeking alpha. Now back to the video. All right, so here's the chart of uh, Apple. We're looking at the last uh, two years of data. Before we get to the indicators, as a reminder, we'd really appreciate it if you like the video. Go ahead and subscribe to our Market Misbehavior channel if you haven't already. It would be great to have you along on your investment journey. I hope you get, I give you some things to uh, think about as you uh, evolve your investment process. So looking at the chart of Apple, let's talk about two different types of indicators. First, leading indicators. What are the types of indicators that help you anticipate that a turn may be coming or that something might be coming? Divergences are one of my favorite leading indicators because divergences actually signal something toward the end of a trend. And here's what I mean. Look at Apple year to date. So 2023 made a bottom actually in June, or excuse me, January of 2023, right? Last, end of last year, Apple's making a new low going into the end of the year. 
turns on a dime, and January was actually January was actually quite strong. Continued higher, pretty much un, uninterrupted uh, through the peak in July. Right now, look at what happened as we go higher. You can see that the momentum, as based on the RSI indicator, this is an indicator created by Wells Wilder, and we've had other videos on our YouTube channel talking about RSI and different ways to think. But I'll put some links in the description below if you want to find more information about the RSI indicator. But basically, this measure of momentum overall is constructive because uh, it's uh, above 50. And really, for me, remaining above 40 is what's most important. That tells you we're more in a bullish phase. It tells you the conditions are pretty strong. Rarely became overbought, but occasionally did when the stock would rally. Look here in June. And at the end of June, yeah, this move higher. And the RSI got up to around 78, we'll call it. Then look at what happened in July. We made another new high here. We made a new closing high, but not an intraday high at the end of July. But look at the RSI indicator. This pattern where you see higher highs in price and lower peaks in momentum is called a bearish momentum divergence. So if you look at what happens, the reason why I call this a leading indicator is because it happens when the trend is actually still going up, right? So the stock is still appreciating, getting up to near $200 a, a share. But you can see that the momentum is actually waning. So that pattern where you have bullish price action, but a bearish rotation in momentum is called a bearish momentum divergence because the momentum indicator diverges from price. Now, we're showing that using RSI as an example. There are other indicators you could use. I've commonly seen people use uh, like the MACD or PPO indicators in a similar fashion looking when price goes higher, but the momentum indicator or trending indicator slopes downwards. Totally fair. At the end of the day, what this indicates or suggests is that the, uh, I guess, different ways to think about it. The gas, uh, there's, you know, running out of gas in the tank, basically. And so we're going up there, but sort of, you know, losing momentum to the upside. So while we're still making progress, the underlying conditions are actually weakening. And this often happens at the end of a move. And if you look back to major bull market tops, uh, you'll find these patterns with the S&P 500, even with the NASDAQ at times, uh, where the price goes higher, but the momentum is actually sloping lower. Now what happens is we're actually in a downturn. So that anticipate, that tells you to be looking for signs of deterioration. And if you're aggressive using a leading indicator, if you're more of a contrarian, maybe you sell into this bearish divergence just on the chance that we break down, which in this case, we obviously did. So then, of course, we're going uh, lower and we'll get to what's happened uh, going, uh, going forward because August into September, arguably, we're starting to see a bullish momentum divergence uh, play out on Apple. But let's go back to this top here. And so the leading indicator now has already fired, telling you that we might be nearing an exhaustion point. What do lagging indicators tell us? Well, lagging indicators aren't designed to signal any sort of selling uh, indication at the top, right? It's designed to wait until the markets actually rotated. So what did we learn in August, September that told us that the uptrend was now no longer done or no longer going? It was now completed and that we we're now in a downtrend. This is where I go back to Charles Dow's original Dow theory from the early 1900s, where he talked about an uptrend being a pattern of higher highs and higher lows, a downtrend being a pattern of lower highs and lower lows, right? So through this pattern, look at this consistent pattern of higher highs, this consistent pattern of higher lows. Now look what happened in August, September, October. We see a pattern of lower highs. We see a pattern of lower lows. So a number of things happened from this point, June, July, into August and September that told you things were different, what I would call a change of character. Look at this rally in August and how the RSI stalled out around 60. This subsequent rally here in uh, mid-October, the RSI has, has neglected to get above 60 as well. In a bearish phase, the entire momentum indicator tends to slope downward. So after you get that divergence, the leading indicator, the indicator often sags down into that bearish range. You'll become oversold when you sell off. You won't get above 60 on a rally. And that's kind of where we find ourselves now. Look at how the price was above an upward sloping 50-day moving average this entire time. Now it's down below a 50-day moving average. It gapped below it. We had a couple times where we tried to get above this 50-day moving average, but until we can get back above there, it tells you that the trend is still downward. So just simply looking at the slope of the 50-day moving average tells you a rotation from an accumulation phase, really February through uh, August, 
to more of a distribution phase in August, September, and now into October. So things like the slope of the moving average, breaking the 50-day moving average, the RSI and what phase it's in, and the whole indicator going lower, just the simple exercise of looking at highs and lows and how we're now making lower highs. Those kind of indicators will often tell you, those are lagging indicators telling you something has happened. You can also just use trend line analysis. Trend lines are one of the most commonly used uh, lagging indicators, right? You just draw some trend line. It's hard. I mean, Apple's kind of a weird one because the rally had a significant pace. Then it kind of broke it here. But even if you draw subsequent trend lines sort of capturing some of these uh, secondary moves in the price, however you draw the trend lines, we've probably broken it by now, right? So the other thing you can do is during an uptrend, draw trend lines that track the low prices and we start to break those trend line uh, levels and we start to break moving averages. That suggests that the uptrend is no longer in play and now we're in a downtrend. So that's sort of what has happened, and that's how you could use a leading indicator like divergences and lagging indicators like moving averages, trend lines, highs and lows, or Dow theory as we call it, to sort of recognize the shifts in, uh, in, in momentum. What are we seeing now? I would argue that the overall trend, sorry, I got the uh, trend lines away here. The overall trend is still uh, is still bearish, what I call the primary trend. Now, this is sort of a debated topic, right? What does it mean to call the primary trend? Um, some um, uh, strategists and some authors have, uh, have said that the primary trend has a particular time frame. For me, when I use the word, the phrase primary trend, I'm talking about the main trend that you are trying to analyze based on your time frame. For me, that's usually like one to two months, uh, one to three months maybe on average. For you, it might be one to three hours or one to three years, right? So the primary trend, in my opinion, for you as an investor is that time frame where you are trying to win this game, right? Where are you trying to apply this toolkit? But then we have a shorter term, what I call a tactical time frame, and a longer term, more of a secular time frame that probably plays, a, you know, it, that relates to the time frame that you're working with. But the primary trend is that main, uh, that main uh, time frame. For me, the primary trend has rotated. The primary trend has rotated from an uptrend for, uh, you know, first half of 2023 to now a downtrend, and I can define that by the fact that the 50-day moving average is sloping downwards, we have lower highs and lower lows, the momentum is in the bearish range. What would it take to signal a change of character back to a bullish phase? Well, let's talk about what we what we learned earlier about a um, the leading indicators and the lagging indicators. The leading indicator we talked about was a bullish divergence. So look what's happened here in August and September with lower peaks in um, uh, price, but higher peaks in momentum. Don't look now, but we actually have a um, uh, bullish momentum divergence right here with lower prices and higher momentum. So that actually suggests that we may be nearing an end to this t downtrend or an exhaustion point. Here's the problem with leading indicators and the reason why I personally like to wait for the confirmation that a lagging indicator would provide. Sometimes with leading indicators, you're just way too early. You get a bullish divergence. They don't always play out as you'd expect. Maybe the price continues lower. So the leading indicator of a bullish divergence tells me to be looking for signs of accumulation in Apple. Now I look for the lagging indicators, what I call signs of accumulation, telling me things are improving. So what would I be looking for on the chart of Apple? Here's some things that I'm watching in uh, mid-October of 2023. Number one, we've made a pattern of lower highs and lower lows. Let's change that pattern. Can we make a higher low? Can we make a new swing high? That change from downtrend to uptrend, according to Charles Dow, is usually a really important thing to look for. For now, even though we've broken down through the 50-day moving average, once again in play here at the end of uh, the week here, we're still above an upward sloping 200-day moving average. The S&P 500 is still above its own 200-day moving average, which is just above 4,200. As long as that level holds, the downtrend really isn't playing out too deeply. So if we hold that 200-day, that would validate for me a potential change of character. We break the 200-day, and that would tell me that the leading indicator that we saw is probably no longer correct, and then we might be seeing much further uh, deterioration. You can also use things like uh, Fibonacci retracements and just simply taking the low from uh, January of 2023, the high from uh, July of 2023, and then looking at where these different levels are, you'll note right here that the 38.2% retracement, so basically retracing 38.2% of the way back down to the low from earlier this year, gives us a support level just below 170. Don't look now, that's actually right where we bounced off of in uh, late September. So as long as that level holds, that could indicate a change of character, right? A rotation higher. But 
If we break down there, all of a sudden that is a lagging indicator telling me we're still going down. So the way that this chart works for me, I think Apple's at a crucial moment. We've bounced off of a pretty well, clearly defined level of support with the 200 day moving average with Fibonacci levels uh, and, uh, and just the overall uh, trend characteristics. We have seen a bullish momentum divergence, which tells me this might be the beginning of something more meaningful. I'd love to see us go a little further and make a higher low, some of those confirmational tools that we talked about, but I am wary of a break below sort of 168. That would take us below the September low, below the first Fibonacci level, below the 200 day moving average. Those things happen. I could see much further downside potential for a chart like Apple. How does that help you make sense of leading indicators versus lagging indicators? Which of these indicators do you use in your own trading or do you have different indicators that fit into that leading or lagging bucket? Drop a comment below and let me know. Also, while you're there, let me know what you think of Apple. Are you a buyer or seller here and why? For Market Misbehavior, I'm Dave Keller. Thanks so much for joining me today. Have a great one. We'll talk to you again soon.